Welcome to another moment in the Word. The Jewish leaders have looked at Jesus, listened to him teach, and as a result they marveled and questioned, how is this man who has not been taught, not formally educated, not a man with letters behind his name, speaking with such authority? How is that? And as a result, Jesus responds, and he says that if any man purposes to do the will of him who sent him, that he would understand the doctrine, he would understand the teaching, he would understand the source, he would understand the meaning of the message that he has given. Jesus now is going to further explain what it means to desire the will of God. Secondly, he is going to reveal their hearts, and that's what we're looking at now. What is in your heart as you open up God's Word, and how do you know that your heart is really for Him? Let's see as we look at verses 19 to 21 in John chapter 7. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep the law? Why go about to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who goes about to kill you? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marvel. Well, as we look at this, it looks like this is a, a, a verse or a thought out of sync with the rest of what Jesus has said, but actually it's not. It's right in line because he is saying just before that that not only is he true and faithful, but that he is also not unrighteous. Remember, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth comes by Jesus Christ. Jesus is God who has come in the flesh. They're actually debating the one who is the fulfillment of the law, and they're questioning him. They don't know who Jesus is. They are thinking he's just a man. And many today think he's just a religious leader. He's just a man and not realizing that Jesus is God. That They're debating with God. And so he then says, did not Moses, that's their highest authority. To them, it is all about the Torah. And yet, God gave Moses the Torah. The Torah is not just simply from Moses' pen. No, it wasn't something that Moses concocted. It was something that was the very expression of the heart of God. And it was given by actually Christ himself. And that he has given the law. So it's a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question which in the Greek implies a positive answer. And that is... Did not Moses give you the law? Of course he gave you the law. But then he goes right to the heart of the problem. And that is, he exposes their heart. And he says, yet none of you keeps the law. Now, is he meaning that in a, a euphemistic way or a way that is much more than just simply none of you? But he's really not saying none of you. No, he is saying none of you. He means it just as he said it. it. We find in Romans chapter 3, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's quoted from King David. That's from Psalm 14, verses 1 and 3, where we find there is none that doeth good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. That's both Jew and Gentile looks down upon the children of men to see if there is any who understand. You see, we can't understand unless we do. Do the will of him that sent Jesus. Do the will of God. None that understands. There is none who seeks God. And then God says, they have all turned aside. They've all together become corrupt. There is none good, no, not one. And that includes you and me. We, by nature, do not seek after God. Instead, it is His Spirit that calls us that we then must respond to in order for us to have a heart for God. Now, it's really interesting. What Jesus is doing here is turning the tables. They're saying, how is it that you, without letters, can somehow or another know the law? And Jesus is saying, but how is it that you who know the law 
don't obey it. They're saying that you've got to be unrighteous. You must have a demon, in fact. And Jesus said, if you were righteous, you wouldn't seek to kill me. So now, Jesus is exposing the heart. Why is that? Because it is love that motivates someone to do the law. Remember when uh, Solomon had two women that came and, and they both claimed that they had a baby that had died. One claimed, actually, that the baby, her baby, uh, uh, had lived, but the others uh, had switched it. And so Solomon has this uh, really dubious problem. How does he determine which mother is the real mother of the child that is living? And so he said, uh, and this is in 1 Kings 3, uh, he says, bring a sword, cut the baby in half, give both mothers the parts of the baby. What is, Mo what is Solomon really doing? He is challenging the love of the mother. The one you see who really loves her child, she will be the one who will say, no, I would rather my child live and another have it than that my child, whom I love, dies. Now, that same principle, love motivates. Love, God says, motivates Israel to obey. You may be familiar with the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. And that is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. There is one God, and if you believe that, then that will set you up for the law of Moses. And that is that there is only one God. You're not to make any graven image. You're not to take his name in vain. You will worship him. And if you do the first of the tablets, then you will automatically do the second. And that is to love not only the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might, but you'll love your neighbor as yourself. But notice that's what it says. Ahava Elohim. And that is, it is the Lord that you're to love. It is love that motivates someone to obey. You will love the Lord with all your heart. That is your will. You will love him with all your soul. That's your mind. That's your emotions. That's your conscience. That's your will. And you will love him with all your might. That means you will actually obey him. You will actually act out your love for him. That's why Jesus said, why do you seek to kill me? Because what he was doing is revealing you don't love God. If you loved God, then you certainly wouldn't try to kill me, who is God. And if you loved God, even if you didn't believe that I am God, Jesus said, then you wouldn't kill me because all mankind is made in the image of God. And it doesn't matter what the race is, what the nationality is. It doesn't matter what their class is. It doesn't matter if they're in utero or if they're in their old age. It doesn't matter. All are made in the image of God. And you, by your intent to kill me, reveal your hatred toward God. Now... With that in mind, notice the response. It says in verse 20, the people answered. And now, isn't this interesting? Because if you look back and you find in verse 15, it was the Jewish leaders that had murmured. They were the ones that actually were talking among themselves. How does this individual who's never gone to one of our yeshivas, one of our schools, one of our seminaries, this unlearned, unlearned unlettered man knows what he's talking about. But now they're absolutely and strangely silent. It's the people instead that speak up. Now remember, Jesus is talking to a large crowd. He's in the court of the women. He's speaking right below the place where the Sanhedrin meet. He's speaking in the colonnade of Solomon. And there is not only the Jewish leaders, but there's this vast multitude of men and women that are there in the court of the women on the Temple Mount. And how do they respond? They say, you have a demon. Well, what is that? Well, they said the same thing 
about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, verse 18. And that is that they were having compassion on John. And they were saying, basically, John, you're crazy. But we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. The real problem with you is that you've got a demon. If, if you didn't have the demon, you wouldn't be speaking the way you are. And they're doing the same thing with Jesus. In fact, this isn't the first time they're going to accuse him of having a demon. In John chapter 8 and verse 48, they're going to say, You're a Samaritan and you have a demon. And they'll do it again in chapter 10, verse 20, where they will say, This man, he has a demon. And he's mad. He's paranoid. He thinks everybody's out to get him. Maybe people are saying the same thing about you. Because you believe in things that you don't see. Because you believe and trust in someone others don't see. Maybe you hear the voice of God. And as a result, others think you're crazy. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus answers and he says, I did one mark, one work, and you marvel. What was that work? Well, the work was way back in John chapter 5. It was where he had healed this man that was paralyzed for 38 years. And as a result, he, the man walks, but he did it on the Sabbath. I, that really infuriated the Jewish leadership. And so consequently, they challenged Jesus on why he healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, my father works on the Sabbath, and so do I. If God ceased to work, this whole world would be in serious trouble. And so consequently, I work. And as soon as Jesus said that, they understood that Jesus was equating himself with God. And so consequently, they plotted from that point on to kill Jesus. Jesus had left Jerusalem. He's been gone now for a whole year. He now comes back, and they still have it in their crawl. They're going to kill him. And that oftentimes happens in people's lives. So they get offended, and that's what the word marvel means, by the way. It is not just simply that they are wondering, amazed, but it's also where there is disgust, where there is some kind of offense that they have taken as a result of it. That same word is used four times in John's Gospel. It's used first in in uh, John chapter 3, when Jesus meets with Nicodemus, and he says, Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. And what was the offense? Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Nick, you know, just because you have all these letters behind your name and because you're the teacher of Israel, you don't know anything. You don't know the kingdom of God because you're not born again. You need to have the Spirit of God dwelling in you in order for you, Nicodemus, to understand. And my dear one, that's what you need. That's what I need. I can't understand Scripture unless the Holy Spirit reveal it to me. I can't understand who Jesus is unless God has shown me. And you neither can you. But if God has shown you, then your life will change. And you will have boldness to speak to others regardless of what they call you. Maybe a demon. Maybe mad. Maybe crazy. Maybe unlearned. But you will stand and say, Thus saith the Lord, because your life has been changed and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for your Holy Spirit who is manifested to us, in us, has redeemed us, has regenerated us, has given us life, but also has revealed all things concerning the Lord Jesus, has shown us things to come, and has enabled us to proclaim without fear of man what you have shown to us. We pray for those who do not know you, that they truly might now acknowledge that Jesus is God he is the Messiah, and that truly he had died for our sins, their sins, that they might be saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.